you want to seal the border, vote Trump. If you want to restore law and order in this country, vote Trump. If you want to defeat the deep state, vote Trump. Gee. I'm having a really hard time wrapping my head around this story, I must, I must yeah. admit. Yeah, and this concept of deep state has been so, I think, poisoned by politics and, and, and Trump sort of using it for everything that he doesn't like. And it kind of makes it hard to approach it earnestly. But I, I think we, we have to keep digging, like, think there's something here. Is the deep state real? Is the deep state real? There's this moment in the 60s where you really like see how this actually works, like where power really is. To the height of this moment where the US and the Soviet Union are in this like massive staring contest. There's nuclear weapons involved. Everyone thinks the entire globe could be wiped out in this conflict. And Cuba is centered right in the middle of it all, right off the coast of the US. but. They're on the Soviet side of the conflict. The US at this point wants nothing more than to snatch Cuba, to make it their own. And they've been trying to kill Fidel Castro a million different ways. They're looking for an excuse to invade. And to push back on all of this, the Soviets actually start shipping nuclear weapons to the island. The US has no idea until one day, a spy plane is flying over the island and they snap this wild photo. I mean, it doesn't look like a wild photo, it just looks like a, a random field in Cuba. But you zoom in and you see canvas tents, trailers, missile launch equipment. I mean, the US government immediately knows what they're looking at here. The world's most destructive weapons are actually hiding under these tents, ready to launch, sitting right in the United States' backyard, right off their coast. Nuclear war, 103 miles away. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. It's a crisis, a Cuban missile crisis. And one man in Washington, D.C. suddenly has a really difficult decision to make. Everyone around him wants him to invade Cuba, but he's not sure. Okay, but here's the kicker of the whole thing. Instead of stay at work that night and like figure out this crisis with his advisors, Kennedy gets in a car and travels across town to like a cocktail party. He came here to a house in Georgetown, the home of Joe Alsop, one of the nation's most influential newspaper columnists. It was the eve of nuclear war and the president of the United States kept his dinner date in Georgetown. And the reason why is because at that party were the people he trusted, the people who really had power in Washington during that time. Most of them lived here in this neighborhood, many of them side by side, all within a few blocks. William Colby, the Far East chief of the CIA. He would later become the director of the agency. Chip Bolin, a former ambassador to the Soviet Union. Alan Dulles, who, boy, Alan Dulles, where do you even start? He's the CIA's longest running director and he lived right here in Georgetown. Frank Wiesner, one of the founding officers of the CIA. He lived just six blocks away. Felix Frankfurter, a Supreme Court justice, just a couple minutes walk away. And Kennedy himself had a house in this neighborhood. The reason JFK kept his date in Georgetown that night was because this is where power in Washington was. On the other side of town from the Capitol building, the seat of American democracy. The decisions were being made here by unelected men who had an immense amount of secret power. These were powerful men who were not elected or accountable. And at this point, they had become drunk on the worst kind of power, the secret sort of power that corrupts, the kind of power that our founders sought to check and balance with all of their founding documents. But here in Georgetown, it had moved beyond anything the designers of the country could have predicted into a shadowy, separate part of our government, a deep state that was actively blackmailing the Congress and working to undermine the president of the United States and being horrifyingly successful at it. Unelected deep state operatives who defy the voters 
to push their own secret agendas. You take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. So even for a practical, supposedly hard-nosed businessman, he's being really dumb to do this. As far as I know, we don't engage in assassinations and kidnappings and things of that kind. I do think there has to be serious questions raised about some of the foreign policy blunders that this country has had over the last 20 to 25 years. There's some truth in the idea that there is an ongoing group of people who continue the work of government as administrations come and go. Is it possible for these entities to go rogue? Absolutely. Was the agency involved in the kind of domestic surveillance that has been portrayed in the news reports? My feeling is that it has not. Okay, I'm doing this. The deep state. Is the deep state real? And if so, what is it? Before we do that, I want to take a moment to say thank you to our sponsor. NordVPN is a longtime sponsor of our channel. We couldn't make this work if we didn't have sponsors like Nord. NordVPN is a tool that we use to surf the internet more securely. A VPN allows you to connect to the internet in more secure ways or to route your connection through a different country, which has all kinds of benefits like being able to watch media that's available in other countries and even get discounts on certain things that are more expensive in the country you live in. But most people use NordVPN as a threat protection tool to block annoying ads, intrusive ads, or um, invasive trackers. The internet has become very sophisticated and there's a lot of like secret stuff happening when you are surfing the web. Nord helps make that more secure, blocking the stuff you don't want and allowing you to feel safe while on the internet. Nord protects you against malware, password attacks, phishing, QR code scams, ransomware. It is an all-around protection tool that makes life on the internet much safer in addition to having these other benefits. I use Nord a ton when I travel and I use it when I'm accessing sort of more sensitive websites. Nord also has other useful tools like NordPass, which is a password manager. You can get this together with NordVPN if you choose the complete plan at checkout. So thank you, NordVPN. There's a link in my description. It's nordvpn.com slash Johnny Harris. When you click the link, it helps support the channel, but it also gets you in on a nice big discount and four extra months of free NordVPN when you sign up for the two-year plan and a 30-day money-back guarantee. And you can start using NordVPN today at a discount. Thank you, NordVPN, for sponsoring today's video. So, we ready, Nick? We're good. Okay, sweet. Paji, are you on the board over there? I hear you. Thanks. Okay, you, if you can hear us. I really us, want this. Could you start by introducing yourself, who you are, and uh, what you do, and, and what your relationship to this topic of the history of the CIA is? Yeah, so um, my name's Jefferson Morley. I'm a journalist in Washington. I've been a journalist in Washington for the last 40 years. In the old days, spy agencies were a war thing. When the US was at war, it would set up an international spy operation to best wage that war. And then when the war was over, they would pare down or totally get rid of the spy agency. The thinking here was that a spy agency took up a lot of resources and threatened civil liberties. There's a lot of power concentrated into a bunch of unelected people. Worth it during war, not worth it during peace. But then the biggest war of them all came to America's Pacific doorstep and it changed everything. Harbor, and so Roosevelt now has a license, more of a license to do what he wants. And one of the first things he does is consult with a man named Bill Donovan. Wild Bill, a corporate Wall Street lawyer who was obsessed with the power of intelligence. Donovan had very strong opinions and he said, you need a wartime intelligence service, you're going to war. Wild Bill Donovan would be in charge of the Office of Strategic Services or OSS, a centralized intelligence agency that would be given immense power to do whatever it took to keep our people safe and to keep our team on top. This was the birth of modern intelligence, a euphemism for spying and lying and cheating and deceiving and sneaking and breaking, coercing, dividing and conquering. No idea was too crazy for the OSS during this time. Like one OSS psychologist had this idea that Hitler could be demoralized if they just showed him a vast quantity of porn. Paramilitary operations. Strapping explosives to a bunch of bats and letting them loose over Tokyo. Guys skiing into Nazi occupied Norway. Making fake companies, recruiting off Wall Street from all of his old colleagues, bringing in bankers and movie directors, fake radio stations, anything to demoralize, divide, or Confuse the enemy. The OSS is the first 
intelligence agency that the United States ever has. Oh, and one of Wild Bill's favorite things to do was to have parties at his house. Hey, Are we the first ones here? It's the big night. To plan and plot his operations with his friends in Georgetown, a neighborhood in Washington, D.C. that is strikingly beautiful. Here is Bill Donovan's house. It's now worth $17 million. It's beautiful. And this is where he would have a drink and chat with other Washington power brokers. He would recruit new agents from American high society, earning the agency the nickname Oh So Social. Pretty clever. Okay, but remember that spy agencies like this were a war thing only. And the war ended in 1945. And the OSS got dissolved. The forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. What do we do with the OSS now that we're at peace? And Truman says, we don't want to risk having an American Gestapo. A political police. His meaning, especially in the context of having just defeated the Nazis, was, you know, that's what led our enemy astray. They had a secret intelligence agency, the Gestapo, which wound up enforcing political norms and enforcing tyranny. And we don't want to, we don't want to risk that. Here's Harry Truman doing the right thing and signing a piece of paper that says that the OSS can no longer exist. I mean, Truman was freaked out. He's like, this was really great to help us win the war, but this is way too much power in the hands of unelected officials holding secret information. But it was kind of too late. Putting the genie back in the bottle would prove to be an impossible task. Is it significant that all these guys live four blocks from each other in Georgetown? Yeah, it's very significant because they're the product of this wartime culture. This is one party that just has to turn out right. Here is target number one for the Reds. And who's in the bullseye? You are. So there was a brief moment after World War II when the Cold War didn't exist. We were at peace. But then, almost immediately, tension started to rise between these two great empires that had been allies to defeat the Nazis, but were now skeptical of each other. And senators were suddenly declaring that it was impossible to know where war begins and where it ends. The Soviet Union and its agents have destroyed the independence and democratic character of a whole series of nations in Eastern and Central Europe. And this is when all the intel people that had run the OSS, many of them who lived in Georgetown, by the way, start calling for the resurrection of the OSS, a centralized intelligence agency that we can use to fight this new global war with the Soviet Union. But no, say a bunch of other lawmakers, the Constitution wasn't designed for us to put so much power in the hands of men who are doing secret things. Doing this will result in a police state run by power-grabbing bureaucrats. Too much power to military leaders and their insatiable appetite for more money, for more men, and more power, whatever the cost to democracy. Truman's mind changed. And what changed Truman's mind was the growing confrontation with the, with the Soviet Union. And soon the papers were signed and a new agency was formed the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. When Truman signs the National Security Act, he says, we have to be careful that we don't have an American Gestapo. So that thought is still on his mind. The CIA was the big, shiny new weapon of the United States in the Cold War. And their mission was to, quote, gain and distribute intelligence and to perform, quote, other functions and duties related to intelligence affecting national security. What does that mean? Everybody knew what that language meant. Yeah. Everybody knew that that was, and we just weren't going to talk about it because we didn't want to write it down on paper. Like, what do they do with this vague mandate of national security? Oh, boy. They, they go to town. <laughs> you must stir the ingredients in your chocolate cake. It's so clean, but so soft and smooth. Operation Paperclip, Paperclip, 1945 to 1959. Yeah. Americans wanted to get those Nazi rocket scientists on their side so that they could develop their own rocket capacity. James Angleton, for example, protects a general under Hitler. CIA gets involved in the Italian, Italian elections, 1948. Puts his thumb on the Italian democracy and makes sure that U.S. allies win. 
Operation Ajax, coup in Iran, 1953. The CIA and the MI6 organized a coup to overthrow the democratically elected government. Now that we encourage the Shah to take that action, I will not deny. CIA coup Guatemala, 1954. Bananas, of course, bananas. Again, democratically elected government reformists wanted to engage in land reform, and the CIA overthrows it, really at the behest of the United Fruit Company. CIA is now helping American corporations. The, the influence of American corporations on the CIA actions is unmistakable. Alan Dulles was on the board of directors. Howard Hunt, Birch O'Neill, David Phillips, CIA coup in Congo, Congo, early 1960s, CIA coup in Chile, 1973. <laughs> The assassination operation against General Schneider in 1970 is coordinated with Kissinger's office. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Mind control experiments, MK Ultra. In 1950, the CIA launches a massive program to develop means of controlling people's minds. Some 40 U.S. academic institutions were involved in this kind Can of LSD research. LSD to people without their permission. Can we develop a truth serum? Dosing somebody with LSD 60 times in a week. NSA's Operation, Operation Shamrock, Shamrock, electronic surveillance, 1945 to 1975. The first warrantless wiretap. Oh God, Bay of Pigs, nightmare. There were hundreds of CIA assassination plots. Operation Phoenix. Eventually, Bill Colby, who was later director, admitted that they had killed 20,000 people. Operation Mockingbird, and COINTELPRO, Pro. Operation Chaos, Watergate, Jim Critchfield, Frank Wiesner, James Angleton, Kermit Roosevelt, John Foster Dulles, Corey, CIA coup in Indonesia, CIA coup in Greece, in CIA involvement in the Guatemalan Civil War. It was a CIA crime spree for 20 years. There's no other way to describe it. So by the 1970s, the CIA is this powerful, well-funded machine of intelligence that is doing a lot of secret things all around the world. They start blackmailing lawmakers to scare them away from investigating them and reining them in. These agencies had harmful personal information on lots of people. When I was doing my Angleton book, a guy told me one day when he went to meet Angleton, Angleton quoted back to him what he had said to his wife in bed the night before. And so they had this capacity, and people knew that they had this capacity. You know, the Kennedys knew that J. Edgar Hoover had information about his affairs with various women. Happy birthday, Mr. This kind of knowledge that they had, Angleton and Hoover were masters at using that kind of, those kind of secrets as leverage. Kennedy had this thing hanging over his head, and he knew Hoover, you know, had that on him. And so, you know, he couldn't fire Hoover. And so much of this power is concentrated among just a few people, many of them not elected, and many of them living right here along these streets in this neighborhood of Georgetown, living in fancy homes, having fancy cocktail parties, and kind of running the Western world. It's exactly the nightmare of the founders of the country and the nightmare of President Truman. And one month after the assassination of President Kennedy, Harry Truman publishes an article in the Washington Post and says the CIA should be abolished. Wow. And he says it has cast a shadow on the historical reputation of the United States. The man who signed the piece of paper that created the CIA comes out and says he regrets it. Eventually, Americans start to get savvy to the fact that their government is sort of going off the rails. <laughs> As this war in Vietnam drags on, more and more Americans stand up and say enough, demanding accountability for a national security apparatus that had gotten out of control. And what does the government do in response? They start spying on the protesters. Operation Chaos was the CIA spying on the anti-war movement. Johnson calls in Dick Helms and says, what's going on? There's communists have to be behind this. And so they start infiltrating the anti-war movement and they come back in about a year and they say, well, you know, Moscow and the North Vietnamese, they really like this anti-war movement, but it's not controlled by them. It's not funded by them. It's pretty much an American thing, you know, but that doesn't change anything. And they chaos continues to grow. And eventually, by 1970, there's 30 officers working on it, hundreds of agents. And, you know, the ostensible purpose of chaos to detect a foreign hand, I mean, chaos was in existence for seven years. Every time they were asked to report on it, they came back and said, 
it's not foreign controlled and it's not foreign funded, which was obvious to anybody who was involved in the anti-war movement. There were a lot of people inside the CIA saying, you know, we're spying on our wives and kids, basically. You know, they're going to the demonstrations and we're reading the reports at night. We shouldn't be doing this. Are we trying to exterminate an entire people? What, are, what have we become as a nation? Americans were waking up to the fact that these unelected men were wielding way too much power and spying not only on the entire world, but on Americans themselves. We have been victimized by excessive secrecy, not only with respect to the failure of the Congress in the past to exercise proper surveillance over intelligence activities, but also excessive secrecy has created this kind of mischief within the executive branch. Senator Frank Church helped lead the charge of taking all of these secrets and excesses and thrusting them onto the national stage and shining a light on them. There has never been a full public accounting of FBI domestic intelligence operations. The American people are learning, for the first time, just how bad this was. 800 witnesses, 10,000 documents. Their secrets were shared. CIA, FBI, NSA, assassination plots. Does this pistol uh, fire the dart? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. When it fires, it fires silently? Almost silently, yes. Yeah. Spying on Americans. A wholly comprehensive listing of everything those people thought or did on any subject you can imagine they're having a concern with. Targeting people like Martin Luther King Jr and other civil rights or feminist activists. Bureau agents were told to attack the new left by disinformation and misinformation. Anti-war protesters were spied on, intimidated. COINTELPRO is the name for the effort by the Bureau to destroy people and to destroy organizations, or as they use the words, disrupt and neutralize. The Bureau went so far as to mail anonymous letters to Dr. King and his wife, King, there is only one thing left for you to do. You know what it is. You have just 34 days in which to do it. You are done. That was taken by Dr. King to mean a suggestion for suicide, was it not? That's our understanding, Senator. The CIA's LSD mind control experiments were also detailed to the public. One of the first things they come across is the MK Ultra papers. And so were the FBI and CIA's attempts to infiltrate the free press planting journalists within our newspapers. We would later learn in some investigative reporting that, that this infiltration of the free press was much more widespread than Church even discovered. He reported that up to 400 journalists had been paid by the CIA under Operation Mockingbird. And there's, there's no doubt that it was a massive effort and, 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 and effective. The Church Committee made a few things clear. Number one, that indeed a group of unelected government employees used immense power and resources of the United States government to pursue programs that were illegal, unethical, and generally out of line with American values and norms. And they did it in secret, outside of any sort of accountability, partly because the US Congress wanted to give them money and turn a blind eye. I can recall uh, members of Congress who uh, uh, recoiled from responsibility of knowing what was happening. Members of Congress who said, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Now, I think that is an indictment of the Congress, uh, just as severe as any indictment which is labeled against any of the intelligence community. When Dulles wanted to get approval for the CIA budget, all he had to do was take a top line number to the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he would say, this is what we want for this year. And the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee would say, OK, that's what you've got. And please don't tell us anything about what you're doing with it. And so there was no internal challenge to this world of CIA people. But here's the other thing that is so crucial here, which is that when you listen to these hearings, you see people who thought they were doing the right thing, who thought that they were doing what they needed to to protect the country during a very scary time. After a 30 year period, all of a sudden you woke up one morning and here was this creature that had been created that no one along the line had ever really contemplated. Each of these steps that I think initially were innocent, honest, honest steps. Many of these agents were earnest patriots, but they were operating in a system 
free of accountability and transparency. Even within the deep state, there are people who are doing things for altruistic and good reasons, and then there are people who are doing things for their own selfish or bad reasons, and you know, exactly how many are in each category is, you know, sort of impossible to, to delineate. I got sucked in when I should have known better and where many other more intelligent, sophisticated people got sucked in in other areas. So after the church committee, all kinds of new oversight regulations come in. There's new committees formed, there's new regulations, and suddenly the intelligence community now finally has some kind of oversight. The deep state was reined in. Now they did fight back. Church was undermined and intimidated by these agencies. CIA people, I mean, they hated Frank Church. Jim Angleton would go around and say Frank Church was a KGB agent. Dick Helms raged against him, Kissinger. They couldn't believe that US intelligence was being opened up. On the other hand, Americans were like, oh my God, this is what was being done in our name. But overall, this is a story of American democracy doing what it's supposed to do, rein in the worst impulses of humans with power, and in the process, avoiding disaster, at least for a few decades. One of you is about to be elected the leader of the single most powerful nation in the world. Have you formed any guiding principles for exercising this enormous power? When it comes to foreign policy, that'll be my guiding question. Is it in our nation's interests? Peace in the Middle East is in our nation's interests. Having a hemisphere that is uh, free for trade. There's some very, very sketchy details reaching us here at Sky Central. A new threat. and a new call to give power to professional spies and bureaucrats to keep us safe by doing secret things. And by passing the Patriot Act, we will make America safer while safeguarding our civil liberties and privacy. And then of course, new agencies, all with variations on the same name. 9-11 is kind of like a Pearl Harbor. There's this desire, you know, we've been attacked, anything goes, we have to strike back. This is an existential struggle. And that same ethos of the early Cold War anything goes, that returns big time after 9-11. And the CIA seeks or asserts without being checked all sorts of powers that they hadn't asserted before. They implement the torture program. They massively expand the warrantless wiretapping, the kind of things that we had seen Angleton do in chaos. Those exact same techniques are revived and expanded after 9-11, you know, at, on a very large scale. Taxpayers funneling money into millions of new top secret jobs. 22 Capitol buildings worth of new office space that spring up all around this area where I live to house all these new secrets. And inside them, waterfalls of new programs, so many weirdly named programs that no one leader could ever hear about, let alone regulate all of them. There's not a whole lot of effective oversight on something that has grown so big and so bushy. And none of which should be known to the public. That is, until someone who's worried that history is repeating itself decides to spill the beans. Our breaking news this evening is the identity of the man who sent the Obama administration into defend and explain mode this week. His name is Edward Snowden. He's an American former CIA employee and computer technician. Today he came out as the leaker of classified NSA documents that spell out a secret... And we all kind of wonder, what if we actually need this now? What if we need all these dark windows and top secret PowerPoint decks where they design how they're going to spy on us? What if our safety relies on what happens inside of all these buildings? So we keep funding them. But in doing so, we must at least acknowledge what we're doing here. We are trading a portion of our freedom in exchange for a sense of security. And in the process, we're creating and feeding kind of a new branch of our government power. One that operates outside of this elegant triangle that the founders constructed to trip up the corrupting forces that run the risk of always possessing men with secret power. Most everybody agrees that there's overclassification. there's way too much information that's, that's classified, but information is power 
And the fewer people that have it, the more power the people that do have it have. And the result is that when the most powerful man in the world arrives to the most powerful house in the world, promising to rein all of this in, to rein in the excesses, he actually finds that he can't. He's not able to change much of it. Instead, he sits there and watches much of the things that he critiqued grow under his watch. The thing that he's supposed to control, he finds he doesn't have that much control over. These targeted strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorists are indeed ethical and just. Secrets keep us safe, but secrets also degrade this delicate thing that we have called democracy and accountability. That is, until we save ourselves from their everlasting, seductive pull. The United States must not adopt the tactics of the enemy. Means are as important as ends. Crisis makes it tempting to ignore the wise restraints that make men free.